So should we get going? Let's do it. I just let in someone named Sally. So we'll let Sally get in. Sally. Hi, Sally. Right. And then we can get started. As I told Jennifer at the beginning, I haven't been doing formal introductions because I don't want to waste any time um, with our presenters. But um, I really want to thank Jennifer Knox for being with us today. Um, she's a poet. We're going to learn all about that. I want to put in a plug for Salt Liquors. If you are not familiar with her little business, you need to Google it because it's awesome. There. There's my little side side note. Thanks, Jen. And without further ado, I'll let you take over. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming tonight. I'm uh, Jennifer L. Knox. I am a poet. I have been a poet since I was 18 years old. Uh, well, I've been writing poetry since I was 18 years old. And my sixth book has been published recently by Copper Canyon Press. And um, what I thought we would do tonight is I would read some of the poems out of the new book and talk to you about one of the main operating principles of the book and of my work in general, which is the element of surprise. Uh, surprise in poetry, that technique is not, uh, I don't see it normally mentioned with poetry, the importance of surprise, but it has always factored into my work and I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk about it with you tonight. And after I do, after I read the poems and talk about how I engineer surprise, uh, I wanted to give you some time to write. Turn off your cameras if you'd like. I'm going to post a link in the chat with, to a Google Doc. If you would like, share the poem that you write during that time. Then come back, turn your camera back on. You can leave your camera on the whole time if you'd like. And for those of you who would like to read the poem that you write, I would love to hear it. So that's a lot to accomplish in 50 minutes. So I better get going. Uh, and throw your hand up in the chat if you have any questions and or just start yelling someone will flag me down. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay, I know why. Because I didn't share it. <laughs> so let's do that. Okay, this says exactly what I just said of what we're going to do. So I'm gonna read um, five poems from the book. This one um, was in the recent edition of Best American Poetry, The Gift. You can tell whether a bird has a mate if there are pin feathers on its head, new feathers that start out as stubs full of blood then enshroud themselves in a white scaly coat as they grow. Preening releases the feather, but a bird can't reach the top of its own head. A mate preens that spot, unless the bird is alone in a cage. Pin feathers itch, so I preen my unpaired birds, wrap them in a towel, scritch their heads, and blow till the dandruffy stuff flutters out. They looked pretty mangy this morning. I recall as I stare at the side of my mother's face from the back seat. How long has it been since I took her in for a haircut? And her whiskers, she can't see to shave. We're driving back roads, pointing out deer and hawks as she awes before taking her back to her apartment. Colin calls it traveling gravel. She loves it when he drives and I sit in the back so she could talk as much as she wants. He always answers her questions. Sometimes I'll go hours without saying a word while she talks and talks. When I was little, she'd bring a book to restaurants and read while I 
no doubt, talked and talked. Things children said weren't interesting to her, she told me, and family never had to say, I'm sorry. Yes, we've hurt each other, but only I've done it on purpose. Did I tell you she bought me this car? It's the most generous gift I've ever received. And I should have done this, but I'm gonna do it with the next one. So this next one is called The Passion of the Pollinators and it is about a Russian sage bush right outside my office window. Passion of the Pollinators. The Russian sage bush in the driveway has gone berserko shooting shoots like fireworks, some 10 feet long in all directions. Oh, and the whole thing smells like B.O. Go figure, flora rivaling Disney's froofiest princess reeks like teenage pits. Green, gray, frilly stalks droop under all the bewitched bumblebees rocking the pollen-packed purple flower clusters. Stems sway back beneath their unbuckable buzz. The bees have dumped a thick carpet of petals onto the concrete in the same shape as the bush's undulating shadow, a purple shadow peppered with a few dead bees. The shadow's a portrait the bees painted of their love, a painting worth dying for titled, This Shit Right Here. When I walk by, they follow close as if to say, keep walking, bozo. After dark, there's sleeping sheep in it. My headlights glint off their black, unblinking eyes. This poem I just found out was, uh, is going to be in the Pushcart Anthology. So I'm excited about that. It's called Old Women Talking About Death. When did I become one of them? I used to roll my eyes at their gory stories. EMTs found a neighbor at the bottom of her basement steps, a head to toe hematoma. Use the cane, I told her, shrugs. Grandma and the great aunts itemized her injuries. Poor dear, how long till she was found? They told their stories picnicking atop our people at the cemetery, atop all the men in our family who died young. The rest disappeared, shrugs, so no stories for them. These days, when I call Kay, she tells me about her friends who are dying or have died since we last spoke, and I feel closer to her an adult. Yesterday, Jay filled me in on M's cancer. It's bad, she whispered. I leaned forward. M's doctors removed her necrotic uterus through her abdomen in two jammy black hunks because her insides had decayed into a sarcomatous tar pit. Then her incision dehissed. I cocked my head. She made a starburst motion over her belly button. Ah, I've heard that happens with cancer, I said. Grateful, Z described the process to me after her stepmother died. Now I even have a name for that indignity. Thank God, I hate surprises. And this poem is called Facelift. It's about divorce. Facelift. I met the woman whom I hadn't seen in years at a bar with many happy friends around her. I could tell right away she was different. Flushed as a flower, showing more leg and what legs, smiling with her teeth apart, breathless as if she'd just run her first marathon and someone kind had thrown a shiny silver blanket over her shoulders. I'm getting a divorce, she said, 
tugging down the corners of her grin like a too short skirt. It's a hard time, she looked away. But a little exciting, right? I asked, remembering the relief, not knowing what would happen next, but knowing what would never again. My begging to be loved the way I thought I could, but had no proof. What he said didn't exist. I was all the proof I needed. I think this is the last one I'm going to read. This is about my Auntie Marilyn. If she were here in our little Zoom room, I guarantee you everybody would be having a 100% better time somehow, although that seems impossible, she could get it done. It's called Marilyn, Every Day We Wonder. Marilyn, every day we wonder what you'd think about all this. I imagine you crashing through the inaugural barricades or flying a stolen helicopter into a wildfire with a margarita grip between your knees. Remember gridlocked on the five, you winked at a bearded dude leaning on the asphalt roller. I'd only seen women wink at men in movies. He leered, I might get laid. And you drawled, why don't you get that piece of shit out of the road? Shock splashed across his face. Lock the doors. Crazy bitch, he roared and punched our hood. Clueless how close he was to getting his ass shot. We found the loaded gun under your mattress. Smith and Wesson, cowgirl style, swirly pearl handle, and the serial number filed off. We like to take it out at parties. What a cute gun. We also found several transistor radios and a box of old weed. Cheers, Auntie. With one phone call, you scared my scary Brooklyn landlord into fixing my deadbolt. You were six states away and a 72-year-old woman. There's a pack of kids down the street in a house that's falling apart. We never see an adult. No matter how cold or dark it is, they're always playing outside with a new puppy. We have no idea where the old puppies have gone. But if you were here, we know there'd be no more of this new puppy bullshit. So that's a little sampling from the book for you. Uh, any, before I go on to the next part of this, does anybody have any questions or anything that they'd like, like to know more about? Again, you can use the chat or you can just speak up. I need to see the chat. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Uh, so, there are two ways that I like to bring surprise into my process. The first is I want to surprise the reader. I never want to write the same poem twice. And that's uh, because I want to surprise the reader, but also I want to surprise myself in the process and um, re connect some wires with um, new impulses that uh, I'm open to through the writing process. So I recently heard this formula um, to surprise the reader, you begin in truth. So you need a true statement that you allow it to play out just long enough that the reader knows it's true and then you make a turn, you divert. And that diversion is some kind of movement. Now, if for those of you who have had um, a class with me before, you, re you may remember this slideshow uh, on moving the camera. So once you have established some sort of truth and that could take you one line, it could take you several lines before it's established and you move, these are the ways in which you can move. So let's say that 
you would like to write a poem about a tree that your grandmother loved. For me, this is the kiss of death because once I have looked at this tree and I described it to the best of my abilities, what do I do then? I, I'm pretty much dead in the water. So once I have established what I can see of the tree, I have to move or divert in some way. One way to do that is to zoom in and down, down to the parts of it, to the subatomic level of whatever it is you're looking at. Whatever it is that you are looking at, whether it's a memory you have uh, from childhood or it's an object, there are things on it connected to it that have lives of their own. If it's, uh, if it's a memory of a neighbor, there are neighbors who interacted with the neighbor. There are the neighbor's children. There are the neighbor's pets. There are the trees in the neighbor's yard. So living things are connect to other living things. So that's a way that we can move. Stop looking at uh, the tree and look at the living things attached to the tree such as birds that very independently exist of the tree. They fly in and out of it. They have their babies. Those exist uh, very dependently until they fly away and they get their own tree. There are the worms underneath the soil that are aerating the tree so the roots can ground themselves and because I am a big true crime fan, this is one of my favorite ways to move the camera or divert into something predatory. Um, no one thing or situation or memory is all a, a singular feeling. And there's a, there's a darkness and a lightness to everything. So I like to move in and out of the darkness, like the wolf would be watching animals playing in the tree. So we've gone into the molecular level of that leaf, but you can also pull way out and see it from the sky to see how small it is, um, to see through the rain and the oxygen that it is part of a much bigger picture and pull away from it. And here's another true crime diversion. To go back in time or even forward in time, perhaps something horrible happened in that tree. Perhaps a girl fell out of the tree. Perhaps there was another kind of accident. Um, and to speculate is a way that we can move. Also, I love this image because of those blue tights and those pink shoes. One thing that we can do to signal the reader that we are moving is to change colors. If someone is wearing a green shirt or we're in a green room, if we walk into a red room, the reader knows we've really moved. We haven't just moved locations, we've moved emotionally especially because poems are so tiny and distilled, a, a diversion like that is enormous. And then of course, we can come back into the eye that is looking at this tree and the eye that is remembering our grandmothers and the complex relationships that we have with human beings. Um, with animals, it's easy, but with people, there are always many dimensions to it. We can divert the camera into the conversation that we have apart from our grandmothers, with our grandmothers, conversations that may not seem on the surface like they have anything to do with the subject of the tree, but. Uh, Emotionally, they do. And 
we can move the camera into ourselves and how we stand against the rest of the world and the tree and and the memories that that may be difficult. Uh, so every time we do that, that's an opportunity to surprise the reader as they're reading through the poem. So I wanted to uh, show you in this poem, The Gift, all the times that I am moving that camera. Really from the title to the you, that's a, that's a switch right there. And then into the birds too. So we go from a title, the gift, and we don't know what that is to a very different kind of sentence, almost um, something that you might find in an encyclopedia. So the, the diction has changed and uh, all, it seems almost like that the speaker has changed too. I put a little highlight underneath this because this, I knew I had to do this when I was writing it. I knew I had to start warming up. I had to start getting human. Um, in the top of the poem, it, it really is like an encyclopedia on uh, pen feathers, an encyclopedia entry. So I had to start warming up and saying, okay, how does this relate to humans? And this is where I start to open that, uh, open that valve up, that human connection. And this is the first I in the poem. So when you introduce yourself, to the reader in a poem or you introduce another pronoun that is a camera switch and once you've established what comes before it you can introduce an i you can introduce a you and here my own birds come into context so it's not just this voiceless uh person talking about pin feathers it's a it's the speaker we're supposed to say the speaker but in this case it's very much me the speaker is talking about her own animals and that's why she knows all this stuff and the turn between the first part of the poem and the second part of the poem is all in this line it's almost like a trick that the two are sewn together, the two halves are sewn together with this line. I'll tell you that I had no idea how I was going to do this when I started to write it. I didn't think I'm going to start writing a poem about birds and I'm going to end with uh, a poem about my mother. Didn't happen like that. A friend of mine said, oh, I didn't know your mother bought you your car. And that made me think, huh, there's something there. There's something that I'm ashamed of if I didn't tell this good friend of mine that my mother had bought me a car. That's something I should be celebrating and yet I'm quiet about it. So I knew that that is something worth exploring in writing. But how do you get there? I had no idea. I knew if I started with the car itself, I wouldn't have a lot of material. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know what to say, because I hadn't even told. I, I didn't know how I felt about it. So I started with this other story that I had known for a long time, and it was when I put the two of them together. Not sure how that they. Not sure how they were going to turn out. That the poem opened. And I found out things about how I felt about my mother that I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, but this is the line that hinges the two parts right there. And then I have a we, so it's not just 
me and the birds, there's a, a we now, and my mother's in the car. Um, my husband's name is mentioned in here. And suddenly you know that the three of us are in the car. So we've moved from this to the three of us in the car, which is where we're going to be through the rest of the poem. And this is being covered up, sorry. Uh, sometimes I'll go hours without saying a word. So I've moved the camera into an emotional truth that was not available to the reader before we got to this line. I've admitted something, I've taken a risk. And now I'm going backwards in time, which is another way that you can move. And when I go backwards in time, the, ret the reticence of the speaker to talk about this relationship hopefully becomes clearer. This is what I did not know before I started writing this poem. Only I have done it on purpose because my mother is incapable of knowing those things, but I do. My mother wouldn't be able to write this poem. I can. So connecting these two seemingly unconnected things, I hope surprises the reader in where they arrive. And it certainly surprised me as I was writing it. And this also surprised me um, that when I thought about it, it was certainly the most generous gift I'd ever received in my life. And yet I felt like I couldn't celebrate it. So hopefully the poem is a way of celebrating. Okay. So I hope, I'm gonna look at one more, but I hope that it's clear that before you move on and before you move that camera and you deflect that what you have written has to be clear to the reader before you can shift off and, and give them that surprise. So in other words, the reader must be grounded before you move. If you think about um, all the lines about the birds before, I had to write quite a few of them before I started introducing the human part of it. And then certainly before I switched over to, this is actually a poem about my, myself and my mother. Uh, so I wanted to ground the reader before I did that. In this poem, same thing, uh, moving from the title into the first line, Remembering, that's a way to move the camera. Uh, this is all fake, but these are very much my people. My grandmother and my great aunts love to sit, or they loved sitting around and talking about who was in the hospital and that was just how they talked. They're from Metropolis, Illinois. And oh, they, would, they could talk about cancer till the cows came home. Uh, so, Every one of these yellow bars is meant to show where I'm moving it. Some people think poetry is very, like the, that the language of poetry is very vaporous and um, that it lacks concreteness, not for me and certainly not for the poets I love. Their use of words is distilled somebody said to me once that uh, a poem is like, you know, those little bags that you could put six comforters, two blankets, 11 sweaters in and suck all the oxygen out with a vacuum and end up with something the size of a saltine cracker. So for me, that's what a poem is. And I can't accomplish that if the writing is vaporous and loose. What I write has to be very it has to do a lot of work in just a couple of lines. So here I'm able to switch a lot quicker. 
with those camera moves. Uh, and this is all true. They had picnics uh, atop their people at the cemetery, and not just on Memorial Day, like they'd go out there on Saturday and do it. Uh, here are three big camera moves. Moving to my stepmother, Kathy, and then uh, my friend, June, telling me about another friend of ours. And then as I was listening to June, she actually did that thing, the dehist. And I remember that somebody else had told me that. And this was the motivation to write the poem. That a woman was telling me about another woman's cancer. And in her description of it, I remembered a friend telling me about her stepmother's cancer. And then I remembered all of my my grandmother and my great aunts. And I thought, what is this? What I don't have conversations like this with men. What is it about this, this topic that women could sit around and chew the fat on it? And uh, I think it has something to, wait, go back. Sorry, I lost it. Does anyone know how to go back? Oh, I think I do. I got it. Uh, I think it's because of this, the I hate surprises, that women familiar, familiarize themselves with, uh, with this world because they don't want to suffer an ignorant indignity. They want to know what's happening. And so much knowledge has been, so much information has been denied and withheld from women that with each other, we can talk about this stuff. Um, certainly all the true crime podcasts right now where there are two women just talking about murder. Uh, so moving from, moving from uh, experience to experience is another way to move the camera. Note, I didn't feel the need to connect them and uh, sew them together and, and show the stitching like, and let me tell you about another friend of mine, Kay. I didn't feel the need to do that because it's a poem. I can just jam them right together. We're lucky that way. Now, when you're writing for yourself and you want to surprise yourself, that requires a bigger stretch. Uh, it requires a greater risk because when you're sitting there by yourself and you're typing, 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 it, it, gets, it gets boring, it gets lonely, and you know that you're failing a lot when you're doing this. So you want to accept the first thing that your brain gives you, the first uh, analogy that your brain hands you. And you have to say, no, I'm gonna go deeper. And that could mean revealing something about yourself that you might be uncomfortable with. But when you do that, you are reconnecting wires in your brain, pass passages that have been severed in trauma. They've done uh, research on people with PTSD. Writing helps them reconnect, uh, reconnect the left and right hemisphere and the front and the back. So, Reaching, it, that also happens in REM, in REM sleep. If you've ever, have, uh, when you're walking or um, there's those little paddles that with the electrodes that activate both sides of your brain, that's what they're doing. They're making your uh, brain waves go back and forth. And that's something that we could do for ourselves. And that's hopefully where the surprise comes from. And it might also necessitate Failure, but that's okay because you don't have to show this to anybody. Uh, reaching, reconnecting the brain. So there are big differences in people with PTSD brains and um, writing is one of the things that can ameliorate that. It helps people with PTSD understand uh, understand impulsivity 
and make fewer impulsive decisions. And if, if you are remembering all the way back to your childhood, that is strengthening your memory and it's helping you uh, make better long-term decisions. So for myself in this poem, as I said, this was my stretch is getting to this and the we've hurt each other on purpose. Those were the places where I surprised me. And here, the fact that I hate surprises. And isn't it funny that I'm talking right now about surprises and how to engineer surprises and I figure out, you know what? I hate surprises. Uh, but hopefully if I'm, if I'm writing, I like to call it writing above my head, writing over my head, I'm going to take the risk to do it. And the payoff may not be comfortable, but it certainly is the reason, the reason why I do it. So let's write something. This is the time when you have an opportunity to write based on the things I've been talking about. Uh, so begin with a memory, a concept or a situation or an observation, something that you've been thinking a lot lately. It could be something you saw. It could be something you remember. It should, you should be able to summarize it in about uh, two sentences. So if it's very complicated, maybe set that one aside so you can unpack it at a later time. Uh, begin with a memory concept, situation, or observation that can be summarized in about two sentences. Once you've defined it, you're going to move the camera to a new place and go as far away as you can from where you started. So reach into the bag, go far away, pull something out, and then unpack it. Look around. And then once you've done that, reach into the bag again and unpack it. So you're going to look at something, move the camera, look at something, move the camera, um, and then end the poem by sharing something that surprised you, a statement that surprised you about the process of everything that you have described. So you're going to go like a bee from flower to flower to flower to flower. And if the emotional truth that you find in this is, I like dandelions best, that's how you end the poem. I like dandelions best. So it's about 6.43. How about 15 minutes? There is a link. I'm going to put a link in the chat if you would like to share your poems to that link. Everybody should have access to it. And then we'll come back at seven and maybe some people would like to share what they've written. Does that sound good? Anybody have any questions? Okay, so I'm going to put the link up in here. And we'll see you back at seven o'clock. Okay, good. Awesome. I'm turning my All camera right. off. This is going to make my head, my face. Yes, squishy. it makes my mouth hang open. <laughs> so I can't write in coffee shops. I'm like that. Okay, see you back. Jen, can you mute yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yes.
These are great poems. While other people are finishing up, would anyone like to read and share what they've written? Sarah, I hope you say yes. What? <laughs> Me? I think I have to change screen. Sarah, are you going to read your swim team poem? Yeah, it's can you awesome. hear me? Can you hear me? I have to go back to the screen. Let me see if I can. Oh, yeah, there it is. Wait. All right. Okay. Um, this one is called Or Something. I put it all over the place. Okay. My swimming coach used to say that we could be goddesses, not girls. Other days, it was hungry she-wolves or sharks schooling around a wounded porpoise. This is the part of the movie where I cover my eyes, the dog with rabies, the rifle. Every morning I say to my cats, please don't die today. This morning on Facebook, a smiling dog dressed as a peacock, an orange cat in a puddle of sun, dead now because someone who loved them said it's time and pulled that terrible trigger. Coach was right. We can be God or something. Oh, man. Fabulous. I think one of those dogs was yours. Uh-huh. Wearing yeah. a peacock costume. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm yeah, me too. She something. actually loved it when we laughed. She would try and make us laugh. Oh, yeah. We don't deserve them. I'm I just know. really sorry. That's got to be the hardest thing in the history of the world to do. You know, it's like we take on our own pain to spare them theirs, mm -hmm. you know, but it is kind of playing God. So anyway, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to wax maudlin. I appreciate it. it it's a wonderful poem. Thanks. Would anyone else like to read what they've written? I'll read. Okay. The hatchback was stuffed with boxes and blankets and clothes on hangers heading east out of Bakersfield, glancing down from our Subaru, husband, dog, and I heading towards the Nevada border. Hasta la vista, California, I whispered, watching the lone woman in my rearview mirror. I recall my own hands gripping the leather steering wheel of my Impreza, boxes and clothes and blankets covering my possessions so no one would know, know that I was in between, heading south on the I-5, from Portland to Escondido. She's migrant. My husband glanced, craning his neck, unable to understand what I knew because she had, been, she had once been me, life precarious, home on four wheels. Wow. Lovely. You really, you really took on a lot of territory. Thank you. Lovely. Anybody else? Yes, please. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm a bit stressed and it's like one o'clock in the morning where I am. Oh, well, <laughs> um, I assume you're in Iceland. No, but I am from Iceland. I'm in London. Oh, I'm studying. So yeah, I'm actually handing in my bachelor on Friday. In hey, writing, So this Yay. was a little treat. <laughs> um, yeah, but my poem is on the bottom of the file. I think it's called um, This Cup. I have been thinking about my mother reading my future from this cup. There's a boat and a cat and a slow journey pointing at the swirled sediment. Oh, nice, I said. Thanks, mom. It's cracked now after you banged it against the sink by accident. Your washing up is so rough. Soap, scrub, scrub, soap, and leave it to dry in the windowsill. But I'm still happy I stole it. And when mom complains there's one missing from the set, I say, mom, come on. It's a good story. Like that time dad cut up the candle that looked like a bar of chocolate and served it to your friends. I mean, it looked like chocolate. Fred calls and is having relationship problems again. Damn. So I let him drink from the cup. 
and the crack is the same color as his hair that is dyed chestnut brown now. And I serve coffee and fruit because it's summer and because that's all I have. And I say, hey, let me read your future from this cup. There's a big dog and a fetus. Fred freaks out. No worries, I say. It's not real. Oh, my God. Fantastic. Made me laugh, too. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes, please, Michael. Two cardinal chicks dawdle in the barberry bush outside your bedroom window. Three siblings soared into their first bite on your watch and now peck at the earth of your backyard. At the beginning of world history class in high school, Patty Jo Castile chatted with you about her sophomore plans until Mr. Bittner seated you in the middle of the front row, as far away from Patty Jo as a separation between Cleopatra and Napoleon. The last conversation you'd have with a woman until homecoming in college, cursed by bum ears, a hearing loss that muffled a woman's bird song and a gruff coach's mumbled fury. <laughs> In the evenings, the mated cardinals tease their nest dwellers to leap into the shrubbery scaffold around them. The cock is skittish when my silhouette, when your silhouette slides into view, but the hen turns fearless black eyes to you as she flits between her young and the ground below. You ace the world history class, the redefined wallflower during the few dances you attended at the armory. Patty Jo might have been homecoming queen your senior year. Somehow you waited 50 years to hear a woman's voice. Anybody else? I can read something. Oh, uh, please. Okay, so let me get back to the thing I'm reading. This is called, it's, it's, uh, it's on the, the website there. It's called Spring, Spring Break Visit. My grandmother was in a hospital bed in a room with two beds. When I walked in, at first I wasn't sure which was my grandmother. Forevermore, she said, and I recognized her voice. We've got to call your mother. She picked up the telephone and made the call. After a while, she handed me the phone. My mother said, it looks bad, doesn't it? Just say yes or no. I said, yes. Three weeks later at college, I received the call. The roommate made a joke. But I said that my grandmother, whom I'd recently visited, had died. There was silence and R asked whether I was going to go back. No, I replied. This, um... It's almost like a little fairy tale with the two beds um, that we have to call your mother right now. There's something timeless about it. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Anybody else? So what did you think of this? Did you surprise yourself? I surprised myself. How so? Well, I mean, the, the experience is something I remember, but it's not something that I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually panicked when you said I was supposed to try to write a poem. Yes, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did great. You powered through the panic. Anybody else? What? What, how did you surprise, what surprised you about doing this? I, I was glad for the, I don't want to call it like a formula, but for me, it was like a, a, a formula of, of when you said, has there been a thought that's been bugging you? And it's mm -hmm. been bugging me all week, what I wrote about. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea of these twists and turns, you mm -hmm. know. That those are supposed to, uh, well, it's one, it's one technique mm -hmm. that it certainly makes it easier for me to write about. Right. And I've found that there are ideas that I carry around in my pocket just waiting for a poem. 
and it's not the one idea, it's the two that have been writing one in each pocket. And when I put them together, that's, that's when it really happens. Jennifer? Um, yes. Um, so, so I didn't do the exercise right now, but what you talked about reminded me of a poem that I just recently wrote. And I don't know if I can share it because I've actually sent it out to try to get published. So I don't know oh, if I, need, I don't know if I need to do that. I, I don't know if it's allowed to do that here. Oh, sure. But, but you it mean was with what we write today. Heck yeah. Go no, no, but I mean something that I've already sent out. I don't think I can share with the group. Right. Am I right about that? If I, I think you could, but if you're worried about it, I wouldn't. Yeah. I don't think I would. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it was something that actually I read another person, another poet's poem and something she said in there almost, it was almost like a relief. It kind of made me feel like I wasn't such a terrible person for something that happened a long time ago. Isn't that nice? Poets it are is. very generous that way. But, but the poem is pretty crude. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm almost ashamed. I am ashamed about something that I had said a long time ago. And oh, so me too. So, so many things I'm ashamed of that I said a long time ago. I'm ashamed of things I said today. <laughs> but sometimes it makes for good poetry, I think, anyway. And so I, I decided to go with it anyway. So Good. Good. Um, something that one of my slides should have popped up. This is also that formula of surprise equals truth plus a diversion. That's also a formula for humor. Humor and surprise come from the same, they, they have the same effect on the, on the brain. Um, that you have to let someone know, oh, I know what's going to happen. And then you turn the tables on them. Because if they don't think, oh, I got this one, then they can't be surprised. Just uh, watch any scary movie. You know, when they pull back that shower curtain, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? So they have to do something new with the shower curtain now. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to see what new horror movies come up with to subvert all our, our expectations. And your poetry, I've got one of your books, um... I saw you at a reading and I bought the one with the dodo on the front. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know you're, I know your shtick or whatever, you know, it is very humorous. That's yes. what, But surprise doesn't have to go that route either, right? I mean, it can be more. Well, apparently that in order to, uh, in order to create surprise for a reader or a viewer, they have to think they know what's happening. That without that certainty, there is no surprise. And although there are many different kinds of humor, I'm talking about the incongruity theory where you think you know what's gonna happen and then it doesn't. That doesn't have to be funny, okay. certainly. Uh, but funny poets often use the incongruity theory to make people laugh. Okay. They don't, for instance, um, you can't really do slapstick in a poem. You can't hit somebody in the face with a pie. I guess, I guess you could, but how many, how many pies in a poem? Right. You don't want to watch a pie fight necessarily. Maybe one line about a pie fight. Uh, would anyone else like to read? What they got? Well, in that case, we made it to 715. I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful to see so many familiar faces and new faces too. And um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me. Thank you so much for doing this. This was really, I didn't know what to expect and I'm so happy. Um, good, good. And oh, I, are you I, surprised? I am surprised. Hey. I knew it would be good. That was that's not well, a surprise. That's what I knew. So I knew that. But I just well, that's this was really that's very generous of you. I'll use the word touching because I can't think of a better word. But 
thank you all for sharing oh, so much of you. yourselves with a group of people yes. that, I mean, I'm assuming you don't know, most of us don't know each other. Some of us do, yes. but that's thank you very much harder. <laughs> Thanks for taking the risk. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank um, you. Have bye. a great evening. Email. Thank me. you so much. Yes. <laughs> bye. 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 bye.